Okay, Shabbat Shalom. And we are going to mute. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, everybody, if you could mute, that way you can say the blessing with me, but without having it be too noisy. And I will share the blessing with you. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav Zivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of all, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage with words of Torah. Okay. So when we ended last time, the scene was David, now king, bringing the ark back to Jerusalem or to Jerusalem. Uh, David was able to really unify the country and create all sorts of national systems, especially defense, since that was the reason that the Israelites wanted a king was to defend themselves against the Philistines. And he's been an incredibly successful warrior and he's created an administrative state that is now gonna be centered in Jerusalem, which will be the capital, both religious and administrative. And he's brought the ark back to Jerusalem and now things are presumably great. His career has been one success after the other, despite the fact that he spent some time kind of in exile, but he did pretty well in exile too, because he got himself a rich wife, a rich and smart wife, and then a bunch of other wives. Um, and he was not responsible for you know, killing anybody from Saul's family. So he just needed one more thing, which was, to get Michal back because that gives him some legitimacy. So he ripped her away from his, from her current husband who clearly loved her. And now he's gonna encounter Michal for the first time since he left when Saul was gonna kill him and she saved his life. And she is kind of disgusted with him, probably for a number of things. But now she's particularly disgusted because he's dancing around, showing off, and probably showing off some of his uh, privates, shall we say, um, as he is celebrating the ark coming to Jerusalem. And she's disgusted that he is, you know, exposing himself to all these women. And they just have a very bitter confrontation. And it says that, you know, she had no children, which, you know, means that they probably never slept together again. If they ever did, it's not even clear that they ever did. So that's kind of where we left off. And so we're going to pick it up if I can find. Yeah, here. It is. Anybody want to read? I can Doug? read. Thank you, Doug. <clears throat> After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I, I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty, Almighty says, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all of your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. 
He is the one who will build a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'll be his father and he'll be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Okay, well, let's stop for just a moment. So David wants to build a temple, basically. That's what he's asking for. Um, in the meantime, the ark has been transported with the traveling Israelites in a tent. You know, and then all the little pieces that get built every time they, they stop somewhere. So why is it that David can't build the temple, do you think? And he has too much blood on his hands. Okay, so that is the explanation that was given, that's given in the Chronicles, which is at the end of our, of our Tanakh, that he has too much blood on his hands, although it doesn't say that here, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, right? Um, so according to Al Robert Alter, they have to try to explain why it wasn't built under David. Maybe David never bothered to think about it. Maybe David wasn't a grand enough king at that point. You know, there's some dispute over whether or not he was simply a tribal chief or really a king of a, of a large country. Um, who knows what the reason is? And of course, do we really know what David said to Nathan, what Nathan said to David? Mm -hmm. Not so sure. But they're trying to explain why it is that this didn't happen. What's really interesting is the covenant that's set up between God and the house of David. Because what, what, what kind of covenant is it? Jane, forever. go ahead. It's a forever covenant. It's like the covenant with Abraham. And I was just thinking, you know, to be given this kind of carte blanche, which is really what God is giving him, your, your, you know, your, your line is going to last forever in light of all the horrible things that happen from this point on. I mean, that must have been like, you know, this raft that David holds on to when you're drowning. Mm. You know, God said, God said, my line will last forever no matter what happens. Yeah. Also, I think it's very dangerous because it gives even greater... Um, uh, it gives a wider playing field for David to do his, I'm not responsible, but you're going to die thing. Mm -hmm. No, good point. Good point. It is kind of dangerous because, you know, like there are it, no consequences to it, your it, actions. It's an open-ended ticket to do whatever you want. Right. And the covenant that we have with God at Sinai is actually conditional. It's not that God's ever going to leave us. Mm -hmm. but it's that you will be kicked out of the land if you don't behave properly, right? Right. I mean, but, yeah, ours has if then. His right. has nothing. Right, exactly. Of course, ironically, which covenant really lasted? It was not the one with the Davidic dynasty, unless someone imagines that there's still mm -hmm. some Davidic king somewhere on a throne, you know, but right. by the end of the Tanakh, we're pretty clear on, you know, we're done. Mm-hmm which is kind of ironic. And whoever you know, wrote this and edited this left this covenant in there. Uh, I, so think Chris it's I think it's important, sorry to interrupt. I think it's important because the if then means that we have responsibilities along with our free will. Mm -hmm. Just being given this open-ended ticket says that David or anyone who of the Davidic line uh, doesn't have to own up to anything. Right. No, excellent point. Any other um, reactions? Yeah, Christine. But at the same time, he's saying, you know, at the hands of other people, you can be chastised like crazy, you know, and I'm not going to intervene. That's true. Your house will survive, but it doesn't make any, <laughs> all bets are off as far as the individuals that are involved. That's an excellent point, because what we will see if we ever get past uh, the David story, <laughs> which we will, we will, maybe next year, but throughout the books of Kings, where we go through a lot of different kings, 
the theme is that when the king is not pious and is not, you know, true to yud heh vav and the people stray, they get punished by other countries, exactly as you said. And when the king is very pious, like Hezekiah or Josiah, then they're still punished, but it's not for the same reason. <laughs> <They're not laughs> I mean, they're defeated. They're not I mean, we are <laughs> Jews, right? <laughs> so, um, actually, um, you know, Ahab, who's, uh, you know, whose father's Omri, and, you know, there's a whole law. They actually have a very long dynastic rule up north. Um, they're actually much more prosperous and successful than the pious kings. Hezekiah gets killed off in battle and, you know, there's almost nothing left of the, of the country by the time he's, he comes along and Jerusalem almost gets taken. So, you know, but they're praised for being pious and for being, you know, loyal to God and all of that. But actually the more successful kings are the ones who are not so pious, who make alliances with other countries, often through wives, uh, Ahab being one, because Jezebel is his wife. And um, they, they're successful politically, economically, all kinds of ways. But they're, you know, criticized for, for being, you know, not, not loyal. So, but yeah, you're right. The, the other countries are brought in as punishment, which is, of course, most undoubtedly an explanation after the fact, right? I mean, people get taken over by another country. Why? And they get exiled, right? They get exiled. So how do they explain that? They can't say, well, our God is not as strong as the other gods, which is how a lot of Near Eastern cultures at that time would understand it. It's because we're punished. And what is the first story in the Tanakh? It's exile, right? Mm -hmm. It's written by people in exile, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we don't know for sure. Um, any other uh, comments or, yes, Jane? Um, the Egyptians believed in ancient Egypt, that they were so strong that if they were conquered by another people, it was exactly because their gods had abandoned them because the Pharaoh was not in sync with the, um, uh, with what the gods wanted. So, you know, that, you. that idea is not just a Jewish idea. In fact, they probably picked it up from the Egyptians. Right. The Egyptians had had a a couple of intermediate periods. Right. And I think Christine or some, some other historian, Carl, you would know that didn't the Chinese have this thing, the mandate of heaven? Yes. Was, was that very much Definitely. a similar uh, thought process? Most, most early states have some sort of divine ordination, right? And then mm -hmm. if, you, if your people are suffering, then you must have done something to offend them or, you know, whatever i mean it, it's it's not unusual the babylonians have this i mean every the 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 mayans had it the aztecs mm -hmm. had it i mean the inca had it um it's you know it's not unusual and yes the chinese did have the mandate from heaven and however now, it really helped that the mandate from heaven was also backed by an army of six hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that always helps <laughs> well even now at when uh, they were doing their final takeover, he asked uh, one of his generals, do we have the mandate of heaven? Even mm. now. Wow, he, wow. Yeah, even he said that. I just, I just want to note one thing. I don't think here in the Bible, we're talking about God abandoning people. It's more punishing because mm. there's this moral dimension to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in, in the uh, other cultures, it's not so much about morality. I mean, obviously, loyalty to God is very important, right? But uh -huh. that entails an ethical behavior, right? That goes with loyalty to yod heh vav -Heh. Mm -hmm. And so God doesn't abandon the people. God punishes them. You're going into exile. And I mean, if you read, for example, Isaiah, um, Isaiah's call, God basically says that, you know, I'm going to wipe out everybody except for a tiny little remnant, which will come back. So, you know, you get punished, you get brought back, you, you're given another chance, 
if you screw that one up again, goodbye, you're kicked out again. Doesn't mean you're kicked out for good. Yeah, Christine? Well, the Chinese uh, uh, mandate from heaven, the, the way that you could tell that the mandate from heaven was being taken away is if there were widespread rebellion. <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go on a little further. Um, let's see. I'll go further down here. All right, Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Okay, so now let's see what David does next. Doug, do you want to continue? Yeah, yeah. Uh, then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family, that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant, and this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods before people from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever and you, Lord, have become their God. And move it. There we go. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do, you, do as you promised so that your name will be great forever. Then people will say the Lord Almighty is God over Israel and the house of your servant David will be established in your sight. Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Sovereign, sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be ple pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, sovereign Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. Thank you. So any thoughts about this um, prayer? Yeah, uh, Christine. It doesn't mention the temple. It doesn't mention building a house for him. It's all about David, <laughs> right? It's all about, well, you know, you promised this and that. Just don't forget, you know, you promised this. And if you want your name remembered, stay with it. You know, I mean, it's really a very weird prayer, you know, because it's basically very self-centered. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, by the way, Harvey has a note in the chat that he, okay, I just had it. Let's see. He says, and it, uh, Japan's emperor also is a descendant of solar goddess Amaterasu, to add one more. Um, okay, so self-centered prayer. What else do you notice about this prayer? I have a question. Yeah, Jason. Don't we credit David with writing most or all of the Psalms? Yes. And, um, and this does not feel poetic to me. So I'm, I'm kind of just wondering if a person is, has this sort of clunky, <laughs> self-serving language attributed to them how are they you know and yet we're supposed to think of them as having this gift of language and music it doesn't feel like the same voice to me i don't know well actually it doesn't feel like the same voice in the context of the story of david in these books that we're reading i mean when was the last time you saw david being pious this way mm. praying to god being humble I'm humbled to announce that I am now going to be delivering the State of the Union, you know, whatever. Um, it's like all these people on Facebook who are so humble, like I, I was humbled to present the, you know, invocation at the, you know, opening session of Congress. If you're so humble, why are you putting it on Facebook? Anyway, um, so it, it, seems, it seems very out of character. You've already noted that in terms of the self-centered, well, the self-centeredness is not so much out of character, but the piety and the style are very different. I mean, if, if David really wrote the Psalms, but you know, he was supposedly a musician, right? He played the lyre for King Saul. Um, 
but this seems really out of character. So it's possible that it, it was another writer who stuck this in there to show David being pious, or it's a moment of just like, let's take a break from the action of the story. I, you know, it, it's, it's a strange thing that's in here. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jane. I thought uh, that recent scholarship has pretty much established that David only wrote a few of the Psalms, not, not that many. Isn't that the most recent scholarship about David? To tell you the honest truth, I do not know. I, I never actually thought that he wrote the Psalms. Oh, <laughs> So you don't have a problem with this recent scholarship. <laughs> because, you know, uh, King Solomon is supposed to have written the Proverbs mm -hmm. as well as uh, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Mm. You know, I, I think it's more legend than fact, but, uh, you know, I, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know. I don't know about the scholarship on the Psalms. Um, I, I, I should look that up, actually. That's a good thing to look into. I think I read it in one of the books I read about David, and it's a recent book. The way scholarship determined that there were several different strains of material that went into the Torah, for example, if you read Richard mm -hmm. Elliott Friedman's book, um, they do it through, uh, you know, looking at uh, syntax and uh, use of different words. And I mean, it's this very, you know, close analysis mm -hmm. of the text. but. You know, let's uh, one of them being, for example, whether God is referred to as Elohim or yud heh vav -Hey or whatever, right? So, but the but the Orthodox who don't believe that you know it was written by humans, except dictated by God to Moses, would say, well, you know, the different names of God, it's not different writers, it's different perspectives, right? If it's Elohim, it's this particular perspective, or uh, the the part of God that is that re represents Chesed as opposed to Yod hey vav hey that might represent judgment, or you know, is it, they have ways of explaining it away, mm -hmm. and maybe they're right. I don't know. You know, none of us were there. Maybe, maybe it was Moses who took down this whole thing. Certainly not the Tanakh, but I mean the rest of the Bible that was not written by Moses, but you know, inspired by whatever a uh, a a uh, prophet. Um. And they wouldn't say, oh, there are different writers here, you know, with different, somebody put this together. This is all like so inspired by God that it's, this is it. This is the story. Uh, Christine, did you raise your hand? Yeah, um, I, when I first read the Psalms, which it was probably in college, they, um, you know, because I was raised Catholic and we never read anything in the Bible. <laughs> it was like, that's for the priest, right? And, and for... But I read this in, in, in college, and it struck me that the ones that are very sensuous and passionate and, you know, life-embracing psalms, that could be written by somebody who dances naked in the streets, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> there is that, right? And, and, uh, and some of the other ones, it just didn't sit right. But because um, I couldn't imagine that same person doing that, but I could certainly imagine, child of the '60s, that somebody who could dance naked in the streets <laughs> could write poetry that was so full of life and so full of like joy, in that it was also material. It, you know, I don't know. That that's how I approached it in college, anyway. I, oh, I was just going to say that this in. In 2 Samuel, this is attributed to David, but there's no claim that David actually wrote this book. So if the style is different than Nathan or Gad or whoever wrote to Samuel, it would be the one who would be responsible for the style of this anyway. Does that make sense? Well, I, no one said that David wrote this it, book. This is the book. Of I know, but what I'm saying is when you're looking at the style of this and you're saying it's different, it's supposed to be a quote from him, but somebody else wrote this. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of different ways you can explain it. I mean, I'm just relaying, like Robert Alter has a note about this in his commentary that, you know, this is out of character for David. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether the style is different from Psalms and that means that David didn't write one of these or didn't say one of these, who knows, but the point is, why is there all of a sudden this insertion of piety 
That's the question. This is someone trying to make David look better, especially because we're about to find out what a creep he is. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to hell. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's see. We we have a couple more chapters before we can get to that. So let's. Uh, this is the eighth chapter. So um, does somebody want to read? Read. Thank you, Christine. Okay. In the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And he took Metheg Mama from the control of the Philistines. David also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them was were put to death. And that's nice. And the third length was allowed to live. Sounds like me trying to paint my house. So the, so the Moabites became subject to David and brought him tribute. Moreover, David defeated Hadadezer, a son of Rehob, king of Zobah, when he went to restore his monument at the Euphrates River. David captured a thousand of his chariots, 7,000 charioteers, um, and 20,000 foot soldiers. He hamstrung ooh, yes. all but a hundred of the chariot horses. Oh, that's horrible. Yes. Okay. So apparently the reason he hamstrung them is because he didn't really have any use for um, horses because they did not have cavalry at that time. Um, yeah, well, also, chariots, you know. Yeah, but they probably didn't have a lot of chariots either. Um, but this is all like a summary of all his victories. That It's not, it's all, again, just like that prayer was sort of where did this come from? This is just a summary that is, does not follow chronologically where we are right now in the story. It's just like, by the way, here's all the stuff he did. And, yes, exactly. When the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadad Dezer, a king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 of them. He put garrisons in the Aramean kingdom of Damascus, and Arameans became subject to him and brought tribute. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David took the gold shields that belonged to the officers of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. From Teba and Berotai, towns that belonged to Hadadezer, King David took a great quantity of bronze. When Tao, king of Hamat, heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadadezer, he sent his son Joram to King David to greet him and congratulate him on his victory in battle over Hadadezer, who had been at war with Tao. Joram brought him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord, as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued, Edom and Moab, the Ammonites and the Philistines, and Amalek. He also dedicated the plunder taken from Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And, and David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons throughout Edom, and the Edomites became subject to David. David the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Joab, son of Zeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. Zadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Abiatar, were priests. Seraiah was secretary. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and Pelethites, and David's sons were priests. Thank you. You did a great job with that. <laughs> that was <just> real daunting. <laughs> so you notice, so what we're building up right now is this incredible picture of David, right? David is pious. He is incredibly successful at everything he does. Militarily, he's able to defeat all of these people. He's able to set up this whole administrative system in Jerusalem. And, you know, so I think this is building up the drama to chapter 11. Okay, we have two more chapters to go before we start tumbling down the other way. Yeah, go ahead, Christine. Um, it's interesting to me that, you know, the gold and silver is reserved to, to dedicate to the Lord. And, um, 
and he reserves the bronze. Well, of course, you make weapons from bronze. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and that's one of the first things when the Chinese emperors took over a place was that they forced everyone to turn over their weapons. And then, you know, those beautiful bronzes from, from early China, those giant bowls, that was melted bronze, which at any point could be turned back into weapons. Right. So right. the, yeah, uh, the Jason Lord put, doesn't get the bronze. <laughs> Jason put in, in the uh, chat, the humble brag, that's what it's called, right? I'm so humbled to tell you how great I am. Okay, now my cat's decided to play with some paper on the floor here. Okay, so <laughs> who would like to read the next? Oh, Suzanne, did you have something? Yeah, I guess I was just reflecting back on David's prayer. And one of the things that stood out to me was that the that the original, um, so it was unconditional, but you're going to get punished if something bad happened. And he left that out of the entire prayer. Everything he said is, oh, you're doing great things for me. Everything's great. But he leaves out any huh. negative stuff. Good, and good. That probably is important <laughs> later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's definitely going to get punished in more ways than one. Okay, who would like to read the next chapter? I can read, Rabbi. Thank you, Jane. Okay, let me, so we're on to hmm. nine. There we go. Okay. Can you see David it? David asked, yeah, I can see it, it's fine. Uh, David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. When, oh, where are you going? <laughs> When um, Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, a Saul steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may, may be provided for it. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Okay, let's talk, just stop for one second. Um, What's going on here with this kid? Anybody have any idea? I do. Go ahead. Didn't Jonathan exact a promise from David that he would protect his family? Yes. Or he died. Isn't that one of the isn't that one of the instances where Jonathan showed uh, his loyalty to David as opposed to his own father? Yes. And I'm getting the verse for you right now so we can take a look at it. This is the verse. Mm -hmm. Jonathan said to David, go in peace for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of God saying, 
God is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So they've made a covenant with each other that they're going to protect each other's kids. Okay. So this is what David is doing here. He's got one more, you know, one more kid of Saul's who's still alive. Do you remember the story about why he's lame? Okay. So I think it was the last when they were running. Yes. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Gail. So they were running away at some point during a battle and the nurse dropped him and he became lame. His name is Ishboshet, and for some reason he's got two names in this story, but it's the same person, supposedly. Yeah, Ishboshet. Um, so, you know, he's now saying, okay, you know, I will take care of you. At the same time as he's taking care of him, He's keeping him under his own watch, right? I mean, he's going to be having every meal with me and in this house, right? So you're not going to go do something underhanded, right? While I am away. So it's, it's a kindness, but it's also like protecting himself, really. Any other comments about this? Because you could, you could say that... Um, he is kind of under house arrest in a certain sense, right? He's he's not able to really leave. I mean, he doesn't have the ability anyway, right, to, to do much on his own, but he's also, you know, let me take care of you here. And um, Alter says that in this chapter, there's a lot of play between establishing dominance and subservience. So here you have the son of Saul being subservient to David, bowing down to him, eating at his table, right? And he's got these lame feet. This is how it's described here. It's not politically correct. But um, in contrast to David, who we just recently saw twirling and dancing around, right? So there's this constant contrast before the two of them. I mean, about the two of them. Okay, so let's go on here. Oh, okay. So then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Mika, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Okay, and the, the one verse that I think we skipped was verse oh. eight, oh. where he said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? That's oh, I think I read that. Oh, I'm you did? Sure. Okay, but I, yeah. okay, sorry. But I just wanted to point out um, that, you know, being a, a dog is like a very, very low thing, right? So it's another one of those humble things, you know, I'm, I'm such a lowly thing. And yet at the same time, he knows he's Saul's son and that he is owed something, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so chapter 10, and we're getting closer and closer to the exciting chapter 11. Okay, so who would like to read this? Anybody, Jason, would you like to read? You wouldn't like to read, okay. Uh -huh. Sandy? I can continue. Okay, Jane, go ahead. In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanun succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanun concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite commander said to Hanun, their lord, do you think David is honoring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you only to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun sees David's envoys shaved off half of each man's beard cut off their garments at the buttocks and sent them away. Okay, we just need to stop here for one moment, right? <laughs> um, so basically a couple of things. One is cutting off half the beard is very humiliating, right? Not to mention 
cutting off the garments at the buttocks. Okay, this reminds me of the um, the golden uh, hemorrhoids that were sent to uh, honor whatever tribe that was being defeated. Anyway, um, so not only is it humiliating to do this, but it's also they're wearing diplomatic garb. So he's actually violating diplomatic privilege. You know, diplomats have a certain amount of immunity, I guess, even in the ancient world. Uh, when David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, stay at Jericho till your beards have grown and then come back. When the Ammonites realized they had become obnoxious to David, they hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beit Rehob and Zubah, as well as the king of Ma'aka with 1,000 men and also 12,000 men from Shob. On hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance of their city gate, while the Arameans of Zobab and Rehob and the men of Tob and Ma'aka were by themselves in the open country. Can you move it up? Yeah, I was just looking at the hemorrhoids. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it was a, does the Bible mention hemorrhoids? Yeah. Well, it was actually hemorrhoids is one of the things that the Egyptians were supposedly um, hit with, but um, the golden hemorrhoids, I think are the Philistines. Anyway, okay. Um, so just notice here. Yeah, I remember it was the Philistines. It was the Philistines, yeah. Anyway, Am Ammonites, Philistines, whatever, you know. Uh, thank you, Gail. <laughs> so anyway, um, what I, I want you to notice here is, is the way in which David is sending people out to do stuff. That will be significant for the next chapter, okay? Okay. Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him. So he selected some of the best troops in Israel and deployed them against the Arameans. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. Joab said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come to rescue you. Be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. Okay, then you so are, let oh, me just stop you for just one sec. So apparently these Israelite forces are caught in a pincer movement between the Aramean mercenaries and the Ammonites. So they're stuck between those two. So Joab does something very smart. He sends his brother against the Ammonites and he's gonna take care of the Arameans. Okay. Okay. Then Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Arameans and they fled before him. When the Ammonites realized the Arameans were fleeing, they fled before Abishai and went inside the city. So Joab returned from fighting the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. After the Arameans saw that they had been routed by Israel, they regrouped. Hadadezer had Arameans brought from beyond the Euphrates River. They went with Halam, with Shobak, the commander, of Hadadezer's army leading them. When David was told of this, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan and went to Helam. The Arameans formed their battle lines to meet David and fought against him. But they fled before Israel and David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also struck down Shabak, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings who were vassals of Hadadezer saw that they had been routed by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. So the Arameans were afraid 
to help the Ammonites anymore. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so, um, Alter also says that uh, this division between different people, you know, the Aramaeans and, I mean, the, uh, the Joab and his brother, and then the Aramaeans and the Ammonites is some kind of premonition of what's going to happen in King David's kingdom, the, the split that's going to occur. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that I'd necessarily, you know, agree with that, but, you know, he knows more than I do about literature. Um, so any, any comments before we go to this next chapter? Basically what you've had is this ascent of David. You know, yes, there were moments, you know, he was exiled and he was living like a, uh, a uh, protection, he led a protection racket and that's not so elevated, but, you know, essentially he succeeded in everything he did. You know, he, he got the wives he needed to establish legitimacy, to be wealthy, to be, you know, on track to, to do what he was supposed to do. He was successful in terms of his military campaigns. He unified the country. I mean, everything has been going his way. We know that power tends to corrupt. And once you've had all that success, and once you've, you know, gotten all that power, what do you do next? You have to be, and actually what was interesting about yesterday and celebrating Purim is that I had another, a number of people come up to me and say they had never heard the end of the story. I don't know how many of you actually know the end of the Purim story where the Jews kill thousands and thousands of Persians. Mostly people don't know it, right? Because the story that we tell stops just short of that, okay? There's this decree against the Jews and Esther prevails upon the king to send out another decree saying they can defend himself and we start drinking and celebrating and that's the end of it. But the fact is at the very end of the story, which is, I was actually quite surprised they included that in the spiel yesterday, in the Beatles spiel. Um, the very end of the story is that the Jews kill thousands of people. And it's, I think among other things, I mean, it's about things being upside down, right? How often did Jews kill people, right? In self-defense, not too often. But it's also a, a cautionary tale about power. You know, as soon as you have power, you have to be really careful about how you wield it because they didn't have to kill all those people. They were able to defend themselves, but they also were on the offense. So it's interesting that, you know, the story we tell does not include that, of course, because we tell it to children and, and for children, right? I'll get to you, Jason, in just a sec. And so, you know, we're not going to talk about how we slaughtered people. But on the other hand, uh, most adults, therefore, don't know. Okay, Jason, go ahead. Well, I think it's interesting, right, as you say that, that we just had this piece where we have David all humble and giving this little speech before God and his gratitude and all this. And 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 how we talked about how he has no consequences anymore and then he goes out and i lost count but he slaughtered 10 hundreds of thousands of people in the next two chapters right um so what sort of godliness is that right i mean i understand there's need to defend your territory but these were in many cases cruel sacrifices of soldiers who didn't need to be killed i mean they were defeated already so it feels as though our stories have that same sense. We, we killed more than we had to in the Purim story, and here he's killing more than he has to. That seems to be a trend. Thank you. Well, it's, it's in the nature of human beings. Let's see, Harvey says, are the numbers of soldiers and deaths overstated hyperbole? Well, it's certainly possible that the number of dead or slaughtered soldiers is hyperbole, but, you know, it's glorifying that in a certain sense. And it's telling a story about a king. So whether it's hyperbole or re reality, it's what the value is that the more you kill, the greater you are on some level, right? Uh, we don't know for sure whether any of this ever happened, but the story is telling us that this is what happened. And of course, again, the book of Chronicles will say that this is why you know David couldn't erect the temple because he, he had too much blood on his hands it's, it's 
an explanation after the fact because he didn't build the temple. So why didn't he? Well, how about that as a reason? He killed too many people. Now, maybe he had to, who knows, but um, maybe not. Maybe there was some other way to go about doing all of this. I mean, we don't want to make the mistake of judging people from thousands of years ago by our own standards. On the other hand, there was quite a bit of cruelty, as, as we've noted, right? Hamstringing the, the horses, um, leaving, remember leaving soldiers who were sick out to die rather than taking care of them? Christine. Well, that's not so old, is it? No. But, um, and and who believes the numbers that are done by the that are given by the victor? You know, I mean, really, that's time honored, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to, the 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 sides lie; they just lie about yeah. how many people they've killed. But the point is, you know, isn't it interesting that the values are such that the more you kill, the greater you exactly. are. Exactly. Well, right? that's vicious, isn't it? Yeah. All right, now we're getting to the really, really key chapter in this story. So does anybody want to read it? I'll keep reading until somebody okay, says Jane, no. Okay, Jane, if you want to read it, <laughs> terrific. All right, here we are. In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Okay, I'm going to stop right there because what do we see here? What's going on? Well, there has to be some reason. Why isn't David leading his army? Exactly. There's no reason. What's going on here? David should be with his army. So there's something wrong right at the very beginning of this story that he's sitting behind. We don't know why he's not in the mood. He figures he's worked hard enough. Now he gets to lie back and, and, and just enjoy himself. But that's not what the, he's the head of the army. Commander in chief, he should be there with his army. Okay. Is it, is it that he's king now and they're more, his advisors are more protective of him? Mm. Or that the war is in the is when kings go out to war, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But let's see. Um, you know, so why isn't he? Exactly. Well, they're, they're doing the Ammonites again. Do you think, Christine, that that has anything to do with it? I think that some of the stuff we read before was not chronological. Oh, 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 oh okay. So, um, I mean, the Ammonites were supposedly defeated. So why are they going out against them again? Right. And as, as Alter points out, the verb to send comes up over and over and over again. It was already in the chapter before, but here you're gonna see all these people being sent. So, you know, He's supposed to be out there himself, not sending other people. It says when kings go out. So he's doing something transgressive here. Okay, we'll go back to it now. Verse two. Okay. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. <laughs> then she went back home. The woman conceived and said, were, sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Okay, let's just stop a moment again. Again, he sends people either out to battle to get him what he wants, right? And he sees this woman, he wants her. He finds out she's married, doesn't stop him. She's beautiful. She's brought to him, he sleeps with her. Is there consent there? I don't know, it doesn't sound like it, right? Um, 
Now she's of course bathing. She's probably in the mikvah following her period, meaning that she is very fertile, right? Mm -hmm. So what a surprise, she's pregnant. Okay, mm -hmm. that should have been something David would have been able to anticipate. She's doing the ritual bath. Oh, you do that when you're, you do it after your period and after another week, which is right at the height of your fertility. Okay, but he's not thinking with the brain. <laughs> if you get my drift. Okay, um, so what happens next? So she's pregnant. Uh-oh, I mean, he just wants to sleep with her. That was his intention here, you know? And now, uh-oh, she's pregnant. Mm. What is he going to do about this? So, okay. da so David sent the word to Yoab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Yoab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Yoab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Yoab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Okay, so... First of all, to take a look at, at what, what David does here. Hmm. You know, Uriah comes and he's like, oh, how you doing? How's the war going? Let's just chit chat and be very cash. You know, like I didn't bring you here for any particular reason. Oh, and by the way, why don't you go, you know, go to your house. Wash your feet could be a euphemism because feet is often a euphemism for sexual organs. But not completely clear that that's what's going on here, but you know, go sleep with your wife, go, you know, have a nice time as long as you're here. Well, Uriah doesn't do that. Now, Uriah is not an Israelite, right? He's a Hittite, but they're allies. But here's a guy who's not even an Israelite who is going to honor what you do during a war, right? You don't have sex during a war, okay? which now David has not only not gone with his army, but he's now had sex during a war with a woman who's married. That's adultery, okay? And adulterers are supposed to be killed, technically, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he says, you know, not only I'm not supposed to do this, but you know, here's right. the, you know, the army, they're all out there fighting and doing whatever. Oh. How am I gonna go do this? That's not right. Sandy, let me stop a sec. Sandy, go ahead. Is um, he trying to, uh, if, if, if he has, if Uriah has sexual sex with his wife, then he can blame the baby. Thank you. Exactly. That's what exactly. I was thinking. That's exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to entice him to go and sleep with his wife so that he can say, it's your kid, not mine, even though it'll come out with red hair and look exactly like me. Um, <laughs> like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, who had sex with his housekeeper and the kid looks exactly like him. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a friend who just told me that her kids did a DNA test and somehow through the research they did found out that she has a half brother who happens, she's white, he happens to be black because her father apparently slept with the maid. Oh, yeah. no, it's not just Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, anyway, so yes, exactly. So the reason David's bringing Uriah back is to say, you know, hey, go sleep with him and her, and you know, then I won't be blamed for being the father. Um, and but Uriah says, I, I can't do that. This is wartime. That's not right. Any other questions or comments? 
Okay, we're gonna go on with the Mark just raised his hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Actually, it's Mickey. It's Mickey. Uh, I have Hi. a question. Hi, Mickey. Um, what was the significance of mentioning the ark being an attempt? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, let me see what uh let's see what uh what's his name says. Uh Okay, I don't, you know, it, it doesn't say, uh, oh yeah, here we are, sitting in huts. Some construe huts as a place name, the city of Sukkot, but if the Ark is sent out of Jerusalem to the front, it would make no sense to detain it at a logistics center only halfway to the battlefield. And the Arias point is that neither the Ark nor the troops enjoy proper shelter while David is sitting in Jerusalem. Okay, so according to Alter, who is a literary critic, you know, comparative literature, um, it, it's sort of a way to emphasize the fragility of both the Ark and the army, that they're both in fragile places, you know, because you don't have a temple yet for the Ark, so it's in a tent, and then the, the soldiers are out there, you know, in harm's way, and David's in his palace. So that's Alter's explanation. There may be others. Okay. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay. Would, let's. Would David have interpreted this as uh, an implicit critique of him? Uh, you know, if David had any self awareness, yes. But you'll see in the a scene with Nathan how little he understands about himself, because Nathan's going to tell him a story that's about him, and he doesn't get that at all. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think David is so terribly, uh, you know, self-critical or self-aware. But who knows? I don't know. You think he is? Maybe. Okay. All right. Here we are. Um, so Uriah is saying, "Uh-uh." And now David says, "Next tactic." Oh. Then David said to him, "Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back." So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. So here's Uriah, you know, okay, he didn't sleep with the wife the first night, and then David figures, well, I'll get him nice and drunk. And maybe that'll, you know, make him forget his ethics about, you know, sleeping with somebody during a war. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't work either. <clears throat> In the morning, David wrote a letter to Yoab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So when Yoab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Yohab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. All right, let's stop there. Now, I just saw uh, Harvey wrote in the um, chat <clears throat> that he thinks this is a scene that's responsible for why David doesn't build a temple. And that's certainly very, very possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So David's tactic of getting Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba doesn't work the first night or the second night, even as Uriah is drunk. So now, instead of that, he's going to put him in the front line of the battle and have him killed. So adding to adultery, murder. And not only that, Uriah is carrying a letter that spells his own death. Pretty horrible. Uh, any responses to our wonderful King David? And Uriah doesn't read that letter. He doesn't read That's the letter. How, he doesn't open it up, and he could have. Exactly. He is an honorable man. He could have opened it, and he doesn't. He trusts his king. Why would mm -hmm. the king do that? He has no idea what's going on. He, well, he doesn't get it either. 
Um, this is but, a favorite tactic of Ivan the Terrible also. <laughs> it, it really? Yeah. Send the, the guy off with a letter saying, kill me. Oh, God. <laughs> um, makes me think of, I, when I was in Romania, we went to visit the uh, castle of Vlad the Impaler. Oh, dinner while people were impaled. Jason, go ahead. I was struck by the language that it's sort of after this semicolon, there's this moreover, Uriah the Hittite was killed as if it was a parenthetical, as if it wasn't the whole point of the story. Mm. And it's just sort of grammatically at a very awkward place to toss it at the end of the sentence as if it were just a coincidence when in fact it was the whole point. Good, good observation. You know, I was thinking um, the Book of Chronicles cleans up. I, I don't think they even include this episode in, in the Chronicles about David. So I think that what the idea that David had blood on his hands and was not able to build the temple is kind of a nicer version in a sense, because, okay, he had to battle all these people, right? Because in, in order to save Israel, he had to kill all these enemies. So that's not such a terrible reason. But to commit adultery and murder is a pretty disgusting reason. I mean, a real one, but yeah, Christine agrees with Harvey. David also sends Uriah to his death, right? So I, for some reason, it's sort of like the Purim story. We think of King David as the great king, you know, the golden period of Israel, Israelite history. And I guess there's some things to, to, you know, admire about him, but there's certainly some things to feel pretty bad about. And uh, I, I don't know if in the popular imagination, I mean, I think David and Bathsheba is a pretty famous story. There was a at least one movie made about it. Um, okay, any other, any other comments or questions? Okay, so let's go back to this lovely text. Um, here we are, Uriah the Hittite died, yep. Okay. Job sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger. When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may, may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Yerubbaset? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Tebez? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger sent, set out. And when he arrived, he told David everything Yohab had sent, had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy this. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Okay, thank you. So... So Joab is going to slightly change the message from what da David has ordered him to do. So here's what um, Ultra says for verse 17. As Perry and Sternberg have keenly observed, one of the salient features of the story is the repeated alteration of instructions by those who carry them out. It is indeed a vivid demonstration of the ambiguous effecting of ends th through the agency of others which is one of the great political themes of the story. So David wants Joab, I mean, Joab to get Uriah killed 
He doesn't do it himself, right? He's having someone else do it for him. Remember all those verbs to send. He sends people out to do his bidding, to do his dirty work. The canny Joab immediately sees that David's orders are impossibly clumsy, perhaps an indication that the Machiavellian David has suddenly lost his manipulative coolness. If the men around Uriah were to draw back all at once, leaving him alone exposed, it would be entirely transparent that there was a plot to get him killed. So that's what David wanted to have happen, right? He wanted to have Uriah in the front and every, see in verse uh, 15, put Uriah out in the front with the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he'll be struck down and die. Well, if that's what they were to do, it'd be very obvious that they were trying to kill Uriah, right? If, if none of the other soldiers were there to protect him and to fight with him. So Joab realizes that, that's gonna look really bad. So he changes, the instructions, and he changes the message. Joab then coldly recognizes that in order to give David's plan some credibility, it will be necessary to send a whole contingent into a dangerous place and for many others beside Uriah to die. So in order for this to be a plausible death, he has to get other people killed as well. They're all being sent into harm's way. In this fashion, the circle of lethal consequences of David's initial act spreads wider and wider. And then this business about, I don't know if you remember the story about the woman on the wall who kills, I can't remember who she kills, but she kills somebody. Yeah. <clears throat> so he says the specificity of the prospective dialogue that Joab invents for a wrathful David may at first seem surprising. The story of the anonymous death of Avi Melech at the hand of a woman, and that was back in Judges, may have become a kind of object lesson in siege strategy for professional soldiers. When you are laying siege against a city, above all, beware of coming too close to the wall. One suspects also that Joab's emphasis on a woman's dealing death to the warrior, Avi Melech had asked his armor bearer to run him through so that it would not be said that he was killed by a woman. I don't know if you remember that story. He was hit on the head by this jug or something that was thrown down by the woman. And then before he died, he wanted his sword bearer to actually kill him. <clears throat> so the idea that Joab is mentioning this woman points back to Bathsheba as the ultimate source of this chain of disasters. This would be Joab's soldierly judgment, not necessarily the author's. And then to your servant Uriah the Hittite also died. So that's sort of like what you noticed before Jason that, <clears throat> and Uriah the Hittite died. And then that's also the way it's conveyed in the message. So <clears throat> Joab obviously knows that this is the message for which David is waiting. By placing it in the anticipatory script that he dictates to the messenger, he's of course giving away the secret more or less to the messenger. And uh, might this, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, why would the messenger have to say that this particular person died unless that was the intent of the whole thing? Might this too be calculated as an oblique dissemination of David's complicity in Uriah's death, perhaps to be used at some future point by Joab against the king? So if the messenger knows and other people know that the whole point of this was to kill Uriah, that's something that <clears throat> Joab might use later on if he's challenging the king's uh, reign. <clears throat> In any case, given David's track record in killing messengers who bear tidings not to his liking, Joab may want to be sure that this messenger has the means to fend off any violent reaction from the king, who would not have been expecting a report of multiple casualties. <clears throat> so in other words, Joab has changed the instructions for the whole battle. He's sending the messenger to David to say, hey, you know, a whole bunch of people were killed, which is not what David was expecting. And David gets really upset about that both because he doesn't want his soldiers killed and, both, and, and also probably because of the guilt of causing the death of all these people. And Joab realizes, well, when you tell this to David, David's gonna get really, really angry. So to, to calm him down, tell him that Uriah is dead. Isn't that lovely? Um, <clears throat> so uh, according to, um, 
according to Alter, there's now public knowledge of this, uh, this whole transgression that Uriah was killed on purpose. I'm not sure, maybe. And any, any last thoughts about this? I mean, this is a very important, yeah, Christine? Yeah, he wanted Uriah to die because he would, didn't cover up the pregnancy as he was basically told to do. No, no, no. Times, yeah, there's right? no question that he wanted him to die. The question yeah. is, how how public is the knowledge? Oh, I don't know. Knowledge. That's why he has to send all the uh, extra soldiers in to die afterwards, because it has to look like it was just part of a campaign and right. it was terrible, and the, the second wave was more successful. This <laughs> is the, the Putin technique. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he sent all these people together to die so that Uriah would be one of the casualties. Mm -hmm. But that's not what David was expecting. David's instruction was send him ahead and have everybody pull back and let him be killed. And that way you would save the other soldiers' lives. But that, you know, but Joab realizes you do that and that's way too obvious, right? And yeah, but, but his answer to his anger at having all the soldiers dead is to send more people to their death. I mean, or to make know. sure you know that Uriah's dead. Go ahead, uh, Jane. Um, so this um, this line where he says, uh, tells the messenger, let this thing not seem evil in your eyes, for the sword devours sometimes one way and sometimes another. I mean, that, that's a very casual response, isn't it, to yeah. his soldiers being killed? I mean, yeah. It's like, well, well, you know, but it's going to be used. I think we should remember this line because it's going to come back to haunt him as because uh, as the sword de uh, devours one member of his family after another. I think David's going to really regret saying that. It's very casual. It's like, oh, well, you know, that's fate, that's destiny, that's whatever. Right. Well, part of it is that I, you know, he's probably not that all that upset that all these soldiers died. All he cares about is the fact that, you know, Uriah, Uriah is killed. That's it. And so it's like, whew, he's killed. Great. And uh, oh, they're there. Don't be too upset. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're right. It's, it's pretty casual. And it's pretty um, callous. You know, yeah. Callous, lacking in, in empathy and uh, all that. But then again, as we've noted over and over again, even in that prayer, um, David is pretty self-centered. Go ahead, Jason. Well, I, <clears throat> I know the timeline may or may not be linear here, but we just had this whole episode of all these attacks that they killed hundreds of thousands of people. And surely he would have lost countless soldiers in, in all of those battles. So, I mean, is a king supposed to mourn the death of an individual soldier in the grand scheme of things? or even a small number of them. I mean, the whole point is war, right? You're not at a king's level. You don't really expect them to be asking for a list of every single death, right? It's rare that you would, you would only tell them if one of their generals or colonels or somebody they were very close to, or, you know, a brother-in-law or something, right? I, like, I tend to think from a military perspective, singling out the death of any one person in a military campaign seems kind of trivial if you're the king, right? Right, which is why uh, Alter is suggesting that that kind of blows the cover on this whole thing by, you know, this very specific person being named who's not a general, he's not even an Israelite, right? So the fact that that's being mentioned to him kind of makes it clear what the whole point of this was to the messenger and possibly to other people. And certainly Joab gets it, since he got the letter saying, kill this guy, right? And also, back to the point you made very early on here is David's not even there where he should be. And so the fact that anyone has to relay this message back to him at all Good is point. the reason why we have this whole episode. So Good had point. he been with his army as a king should, it, none of this would have happened. None of this happens. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Suzanne? I'm, I may be reading this, something into this, but I'm sort of reading this as a power play on Joab's part that he's saying, he's telling him bad news and then he's like, but it's your fault and you're responsible for it and I know it and this other guy knows it. And then when David responds, he's kind of like, yeah, but 
like, don't let this upset you. Everybody dies in war anyway, which is almost like a way to brush it off and say, like, nobody's going to believe you anyway. People die in war. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think this is a power play on the part of Joab. Because, you know, just imagine, you know, Joe, we know Joab has been ambitious, right? And, you know, he's maneuvering all the time. He'll continue to maneuver to the very end. And once, yeah, Christine, I'll get to you in a sec. Once he has this bit of information, like just imagine this is, you know, gold, right? As Joan Didion would say, um, this is gold, having this bit of information. Now, yeah, will, will anybody believe Joab over David? Like, what are you talking about? People die in war, you know? Um, I didn't tell him to tell me, you know, but he's got the letter. He could, right? Yeah, I think you're absolutely but I, right. I, but I think that David's also giving him a bit of a warning by saying, oh, the fortunes of war. Mm -hmm. You know, it but happened you to you. To. It could happen to you. you yeah, know? that's <laughs> very, very possible. I think there's a veiled threat there, you know, but it could, just because I really don't like David at all. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> actually that I think that's that's probably true. <laughs> Look, there's a lot of power playing going on here between, you know, the Saul and David and Joab and, you know, uh, Saul's uh, general. And I mean, there's, there's all this stuff going on between individuals and between tribals, tribal peoples, right? The Ammonites and the Philistines and the Israelites. Okay, I think we're going to stop for today. And... Uh, that's Next time <laughs> we'll look at what happens as a consequence of this fatal uh, staying back in Jerusalem. So thank you all for your great comments. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.